Welcome to the Cowboy Office Show, where you'll experience expert analysis and epic discussion on key pillars of the equine industry, including sports, business, hobby, and the horse lifestyle. Your co-hosts are Jody Brainerd and Brian Dykert, industry veterans with over 120 years combined living the cowboy lifestyle. The Cowboy Office Show will help you get involved, ask more questions, and create change. We'll keep riding for you as together we learn from the ride already ridden, learn to listen better to our horse, and make our industry better for all. Each weekly episode, we'll take a ride around the industry in less time than you can load the truck and trailer. Drop your email at cowboyoffice.com to receive weekly updates and never miss an episode. Settle up as we ride into today's show. Well, hello, horse world. Here we are in 2023. Hopefully, we're all just a little bit wiser. For sure, going to be a very busy year. Welcome to the Cowboy Office. I'm Brian. And I'm Jody. I'd like to welcome you to this episode in our series, Status of the Horse Show Industry. We have a great episode for you today to talk industry, the League of Agriculture and Equine Centers. We have with us today, Joe LaFollette, Chairman of the Board of the League, Manager of the Boulder County Fairgrounds in Longmont, Colorado for the past 28 years. Cammie Pearson, Board of Directors of the League and Director in Charge of their CEMC, which stands for Certified Equine Managers Program and Manager for 15 years at the Brackenridge Recreation Complex in Edna, Texas. Joe and Cammy, I can't thank you guys enough for your time, and this topic is going to be so much fun. It's one that, from a trainer standpoint, I have a tendency to take for granted, and I, just the conversations I've had with you two already, it, uh, it, it's, it's something that, uh, that I shouldn't have taken for granted because without you guys, I don't have a horse business. But anyway, welcome. Thank you for having us. It goes both ways there. Without you, we don't have a job either. So <laughs> it's exactly. good we're talking. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a very interesting show because um, with Cammie and Joe on as two experts, but you guys are experts on a couple different levels. Um, one being professional management at venues that are part of the whole horse show production that Jody was just making reference to and how easy it is for all of us to kind of take those things for granted. But second is your expertise on leadership and administration from an industry standpoint, because the league itself, and Joe, you're the chairman and Chammy, uh, Cammy on, on top of the educational components, as well as your position on the board. But, uh, that level of expertise, we're really looking forward to um, this show and all the conversations that we're going to have around it. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, of course, um, the League is a uh, national organization. You can find them on the web at laec.info. Again, laec.info. And like always, we will have direct links not only to the League but to Joe and Cami. Um, as a uh, board of directors to the league that'll come through the cowboy office website as well. So when the audience goes to see some of these shows, they can get to you that way. Well, you know, I think that's, that's awesome. And, and just, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit and for, for our audience, I, uh, I don't want to say that I'm the odd man out here, but you know, Brian, <laughs> my not. partner right there is, uh, is a hall of fame member of the league because of the half a lifetime he spent in the business. And, uh, and since that guy's already outlived an elephant, he, it's a really, really long time. So I'm just, I say that tongue in cheek, but I mean, I, you know, you guys are experts in this field. And like I said, I've just taken advantage of what you do in my lifetime, but I, I would like, you know, for, for the audience that, that most of my, I think are probably in, in, in my league, what is the league and what does it do? Well, it's, the league started in 1996, I believe. And uh, like I was uh, saying to Brian, uh, I enjoy talking to um, um, George Chattanooga and Brian and Bill Chambers a lot because they are they're literally our godfathers of the league. They, they helped found it. And I, think, I can't thank them enough for, for doing this because one of the things that I hear time and time again um, from all of our members is the fact that it's it's become a family you know it, back in the day i think you saw a lot of um 
competing facilities that didn't really want to help each other out too much. Where, where in today's day and age, I can pick up the phone and call somebody in South Carolina about a problem I'm having in Colorado, and they are more than happy to share everything they know. And that's what the league has become. So we're we um, the the short and sweet of it is we pres we um, promote and uh, support the industry as much as we possibly can. One of the ways that we do that is with the annual symposiums. We get everybody together and uh, we, we bring expert um, people to come present and teach the organization on the newest, latest hot topics for the industry to help keep people um, current with what your practices are so that we're not um, getting stagnant and we know what's coming down the line. And then again, with the, the, um, the networking, to be able to sit down and talk to people about what they do. We found that I don't care if you're in California, South Carolina, or Texas, we all deal with exactly the same thing. And uh, I find it interesting every year to sit down and talk with everybody and find out that you are dealing with it exactly the way I am, but you found a technique that worked better than me. So I get to use that. And uh, that's the beauty of it, you know, and it's probably for the, for, for the cost, what I get out of the league is priceless. It, it's changed my facility. It's helped me improve my program and me as a manager of the fairgrounds. So that's kind of it in a nutshell with what we do with the, with the league. Awesome. That's great. Brian? I think um, on, on uh, okay. the level of uh, the different types of facilities, they're small. Uh, I'm a much smaller facility than some. Uh, of the large ones, and we can all sit at those tables and have these conversations, and, and it's appropriate. Uh, and it's so helpful to all of us as facility managers to be able to have that conversation. Well, give us a little sense of the magnitude. I mean, everybody thinks that the horse industry is this huge industry. I'm not sure. It depends on how you measure it. According to the Horse Council, the entire equine industry all encompassing is a 50 billion dollar industry which isn't chump change so that's that's real but if we and the horse show world is one segment of that basically according to the horse council one third of the modern horse industry is show horses now show horses is very broad and encompassing but um give us a sense of the magnitude of how many venues are part of the league and I think, you know, there's always a pursuit uh, on new venues coming online. So do you have, a, one, how many venues are part of the league? And then, two, how many more are there to keep getting involved? We are currently, I believe the last uh, number we had was 220 members. And, yeah, you can see the map right there that um, shows us across the board um what's out there i think we're right around 220 members cami if you could i believe that's what we discussed the last meeting we just had so um the potential though you think about all the facilities and, and cami made a very good point when you hear the league of agricultural and equine centers you might get the thought that well i probably need to be you know south point i probably need to be a, a bigger type of, of venue and that's not the case at all it, it really we have every size shape you can think of um so as far as how many members we could have i think if you think across the board how many fairgrounds how many equestrian facilities there are out there um it, it, I, I don't even know how to tell you how many of that it, that is but that's a lot our potential could be huge and that's our hope um one of the things I'd like to see, I think, or as a league, what we'd like to see is the unification of event venues, equestrian venues across the nation. Um, as Jody's talking about going out and showing, wouldn't it be nice to know that I just did a show in the, in, in the Midwest, and I know that when I leave and go to the East Coast, I'm going to get pretty much the same type of a situation in that venue there. To have that across the board where everybody has a consistency and professionalism with how they do their arena management and how they take care of their facility and how they treat you as a show person coming in that that would be fantastic and a, a much better world for the horse and the rider that way is is there a minimum requirement uh because but who owns them who owns these venues and is there a minimum because bear with me for a minute but 
there are a lot of private commercial stables that put on small level horse shows. Could those stables that also put on local level horse shows be a member of the league? Yes, we do have a stall minimum, but I think uh, we're we're in the process right now of trying to be as as um, open armed, if you will, as we can be. And I think that including each and every person that does have these venues, I think it's important to be able to um, talk to them. And, and we learn a lot from the private side. The private side, where I'm I'm government owned, um, and then we've got another one of our board members is, is Dana. She's privately owned. So it's to sit down and talk together and see what challenges each other has. I can take what she's learned as far as, you know, she has to do a hell of a lot more um, self-promotion than I do, for instance. I, okay. You know, so I, I get to learn from her and then she gets to kind of uh, pick my brain on, on things, which doesn't take long. But um, <laughs> we all get to sit down and talk together. And in the process, we come up with a, a, a unified system. Yeah. And that, that's, it's so important to have that. Yeah, there's such a wide range of ownership at least facilities. Like for me, I haven't found anybody that uh, is similar to me. We're owned by a river authority who operates a lake and sells water. And that's how we're funded is through water sales. Everybody shakes their head at that one a little bit. Um, you know, it, it's, Isn't... everybody's a little bit different, but we all are managing a facility with the same problems. So. What a fast, what a fascinating thing. And it, it, anyways, cause uh, uh, I hear you, the fact that you're funded off water access. I think that that's absolutely fascinating. Um, Texas being, I mean, you know, there's, they, they got grounds in almost every town and county, like most towns have a baseball diamond. Texas got a horse arena somewhere, but you, is it a pseudo government authority when you make that reference? Yes, Tammy? we are, um, uh, like a political subdivision of the state, but, um, we are funded completely off of water sales. Uh, we don't collect taxes. We could. We don't need to because we generate right. enough income off of water. And part of that income is dedicated to recreation. Uh, and out of that came this facility. Um, so, Outstanding. As a, as a, it's a little different. Right. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's I think that's awesome. And I have a I mean, I have, and yes, like I said, because mine are going to come from from a guy who's been a horseman and made his living in this business his whole life and doesn't understand this. But I'm I'm assuming that some of our bigger horse show venues we have, say Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and maybe Fort Worth, are they members or not? And if they're if they're not, is it basically do they think they know everything and don't need any help? I mean, I I, I mean, I'm just I'm shooting that out there because I don't know. Can you help me with that? They are I, members, and, and okay. they are um, they are such mentors for some of us. Uh, you know, Bill Allen in Oklahoma City was, and, and the guys that uh, Will Rogers are. And, you know, I think Will Rogers was a facility of the year just a, a few years back. Um, yes, they're all, they're all members, but we can all sit down in the room and have conversations. So. Okay, that's excellent. That's that's. That's great, that, great information yeah, for me. It's 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 outstanding. So having both, but I and I'm just going by reflex. But you know, with the advent of Tryon coming online a few years ago, highly precipitated by the World Equestrian Games, it, whether that was or wasn't, I don't know as far as their business model. But privately owned, you've got the World Equestrian Center that's now come online. They're open and big right there in Ocala. We'll get to them in a second, but privately owned and. Um, you got Gordyville sitting in the middle of Illinois, been there for a long time, privately owned. My reflex is telling me that we might be seeing this spot in the industry, and I think it's very cool, because why were the predominant amount of ownership on these venues publicly owned in our history? Um, most of that is because its true value is economic impact, and the only ones that could capture that was coming out of tax receipts. I, what what starts to get my curiosity is as we look forward seeing some more private ventures coming online might it be a precipitating point in our industry where the private sector can make it work which would do nothing but make all of our industry bigger and better so there's no harm in that but i think that that's a it's just interesting i don't know if if either of you have a take on that or if you, do you guys study that or pay attention to that or Go ahead. 
well, me, for instance, um, running a government owned uh, facility, it depends when you talk to people like me that, that have a facility like this that are government owned, typically, um, believe it or not, the government may not be that excited about whether or not we're making a ton of money. Yeah. You would think it wouldn't be that way. And it's one of the battles that I fight all the time and it should be. Right. So for me, when you see more privately owned venues coming online, they are at another level. Well, they're also in competition, if you will, to a degree, which makes me, it requires me if I want to keep having a facility here to step up my game, but it also gives me ammo when I have to go beg to the commissioners for whatever it might be, even if it's arena equipment or a new arena itself, I have the ability now to say, hey, to compare other facilities around me, I do have to compare privately owned facilities, which means I do need to step it up. I need to do better. And in the process, I make my facility better, which is better for everybody in a whole. I'm, I'm going to, Cammie, I want you to elaborate just a touch because we are very focused on the horse world. I'm not insinuating anything other than reading your professional bio, but you come from an accounting background and then you found yourself for over 15 years running this recreation center that's got a large component in the horse show world. So how does that come to be? How does, how does somebody from the accounting world come into the horse show world? Fill us in. Yep. I actually worked uh, for a family business before I came to work um, for the River Authority, but I volunteered at our county fair, and I, I served on, as volunteer status there. And we were in construction or in the planning stages of building this facility. Um, and I decided to leave the family business and come to work for the River Authority in their accounting department. I had the pleasure of writing the first PO to while we started construction of this facility that I now get to manage. And I, I worked in that accounting department for a couple of years throughout construction and then was tapped to say, hey, now we want you to run this. And I was smart enough to know that I didn't know anything. And I, I contacted Bob Kaiser, um, did a little research reached out to Bob Kaiser and we hired them as arena consultants. And he came and spent a couple of times, uh, trips with uh, down here to Texas and, and stayed with us. And we sourced the footing materials for the arena. He made a number of recommendations on arena design and um, trained our staff on the footing once we did put it in the arena. And then while he was here, he said, hey, you should join the league. There's this association uh, that you could probably benefit from. And he actually wrote it in his recommendations on his consulting uh, work that I should go to a symposium. So um, I went the, in January of 2009, I went to Ardmore, Oklahoma, didn't know a thing. Went to my first footing academy, uh, went to the first symposium again, didn't know a thing and uh, met so many nice people who were willing to share their knowledge. And our facility, I will say myself, this facility would not be where it is had I not uh, made that association with Bob and ultimately with the league um, because everybody's so willing to share their knowledge. So I didn't take a normal path uh, in, into this industry. I rode horses when I was a kid, but I was never interested in managing a facility uh, that wasn't in my, on my radar, so. That's, that's great. I, I think it's phenomenal. Thanks for sharing. So yeah, Good for is. you. That's an and awesome story, and it sounds like it's one that was supposed to happen, right? I think so. I, I, yeah. When we were doing the construction, I said, wow, you know, that would be cool to run that one day. Little did I know that's, that's what would <laughs> happen. But, Good well, cool. You. Awesome. Well, let let's talk industry just a little bit from from your two views not only as experts with venues but um your leadership roles at the league give us the thirty thousand view on the current status of the horse show industry good bad is it growing is it shrinking is it status quo what do you guys see in here across venues just on a high level and then we'll kind of um waltz into some of the key topics that I think are uh, common denominators, but big shot. What do you think? Well, that's uh, to <laughs> me, it, it, it's a little bit of a 
tough question to answer just because it can be dependent on your region a little bit. For me personally, um, within my area here, I see um, I see the industry leaning more towards the national showmanships type, but that's just because of, of the growth in my current area, uh -huh. right? So I see, a, I see a decline in agricultural land and that being sold off. And so with that, you see less of the 4-H ability, if you will. Um, so I do see a little bit of a lean towards the national showmanship here. Um, as far as my opinion through the league and being able to talk to people across the nation, it does seem to be, um, it, it, we're, we're definitely in a recovery, I think, I, um, personally, uh, where I see people wanting to get more involved. And uh, I will say something that when I say about 4-H that I thought was interesting uh, that I learned just not very long ago. Um, if you're in an area like mine where you start to see less agricultural land and 4-H is struggling and stuff like that, which is not something I don't think any community wants to see because obviously we want our young kids to be involved in agriculture for all the reasons we do. Um, but something came across my desk the other day when I was, I was hearing about some shows coming through and there was the horseless rider. I thought, well, <laughs> that sounds like an interesting, what is that about? Well, what it is is if, if it was a 4-H kid that wants to be involved in horsemanship, but doesn't either can't afford it or just doesn't have a horse or a place to keep one, um, they can team up with a, um, another 4-H member that does. And so they become the horseless rider, but they share the horse together and they get an opportunity to get involved in it. And I think with that, I've seen them, uh, I've noticed that they've saved that, uh, that piece a little bit. I've saw some of the clubs be able to recover some. So that's, I just thought that was interesting. I'd never heard of anything like that in the past. Well, it is, and I would actually challenge everybody. That's a phenomenal idea. Jody and I and some of our other guests, you know, the audience will be able to follow some of those episodes, and as we're talking about the status of the horse show industry, but one of the big ones, and, and we're going to get a couple legal guests, because equine liability, not only at the state but the federal level, because that's one of the barriers, you know. We, we put the emphasis on people that want to get involved with horses got to go buy it and do all this stuff first. And if we could, this is one of my ideas because how do we flip that over and make it easy for people? And that's exactly what you're talking about, Joe, that kind of program. And I hear this too across the country, 4-H, FFA, it depends on the region and the area um, on whether they're, you know, doing well and highly involved or starting to shrink. And so, that whole component, I, I think you hit on something. That's a fascinating idea. Be something in due time, um, share with some of the leadership at the American Horse Council because they're actually putting resources into that part of the industry. You know, whether we call it the first ride, I don't care what you call it, but everybody uses the first tee as a program that golf does with getting kids introduced to golf. Well, I think. I've been a proponent that we ought to be doing the same thing in the horse world. So, so thank anyways, what a cool program and, yeah. and we could, let's see what we can all do to help that. So good for you. Yeah. yeah we got to save that, that, that organization is important. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to lose that when in my, in my region, we do see a little bit of a decline in that. And I think that them being creative like that shows a lot. And uh, yeah, I was, I was thrilled to see it. That's, I mean, that's, that's really good. I would, I would ask a question and I, I try to ask every guest that we have here and yours, I'm going to ask it just in a little bit of a different format. And, and, you know, Cammy, I haven't been to your facility. So I, you know, I don't know how big it is. And Joe, I haven't been to yours in 20 plus years, but I mean, I know that it's probably changed miles <laughs> since then, but I, you know, I would, I would say that, you know, who, who has the biggest influence on you? from the standpoint of a of the horse show business i mean on let's say you're going to have a you're going to have a horse show is it is it the trainers that influence you guys more is it the is it the owners is it the a professional show management team is it i mean who who has the biggest 
maybe the biggest say of what goes on in your facility when they come in. If you want to have a, a Western Pleasure show, a Saddlebred show, where, where are the people trying, uh, where, is, where is that direction coming from when you have a show? Is it from, is it from the professional horsemen in your area or is it from, from owners that are on board of directors somewhere? Is it, is it an association? I mean, I, I know it's kind of a difficult question, but um, I'm interested. For me personally, I think that um, I always try to get a broad picture of each situation. I always start with producers, obviously, because that's where it starts. I've got to talk with them whether or not I can even have their event. So it always starts with them and what their needs are. But I'm the guy that's walking around in the barns talking to the people that are in the show ring themselves. How's it going? How's it working out for you? What do you think? I want to know. I'm never going to walk in there and act like I know everything. And so with that i build a rapport with the people that every side of that from both ends of the horse if you will i, I get an opportunity to talk to all so i'm influenced a lot by um obviously the people that come to set up the show first because that's obviously we've got to make them happy so that the event happens so that for sure but i definitely want to know what each each horse that goes in that arena what was your experience because i can't grow if i don't involve myself in the in the event and i teach my staff to do the same thing like be involved take a minute to stand on the side and watch what's going on in the in that in that arena so that you can make adjustments to what you're doing um but as far as like yeah i would say i start with with the producers just because that's where it all starts for me personally um yep. but it's a all-encompassing question there like i i think everybody needs to be involved that's a, and i that's agree a on answer. my end we we host a lot of uh, youth rodeos, and um, so even a lot of that, uh, the producers there are volunteers. <laughs> uh, many of them, they may, may be a paid secretary, but again, I we try to meet what their needs are. And then we're very customer service focused um, for our, our customers that are there, the people that are running the stalls and, and the hookups and such, and making sure they're happy. Uh, that the ground is right for their horses and um, ultimately uh, you, you're trying to satisfy everybody because if that producer isn't successful at his event we're not going to be successful down the road uh, so we we want we want it to work for everyone oh, and that guest I mean, experience so yeah well th those are those are two great answers and from a from a guy that like used to used to have to do this for a living that's uh, you know i'm very very happy to hear that i know and you know as you well know that the horse business i mean because there's you know so many professionals it's it, and it's probably impossible to satisfy everyone because it's a self-serving business you know everybody wants what's what's best for themselves i mean it just it, it happens over and over again no matter no matter what discipline i mean that's just the way people are programmed so and i which would lead me to another question here before i turn this back over to brian again but and i don't want to say problems but w what are maybe a couple of the biggest hurdles that the venues you think are going to face in the future i mean where can you and i don't need to you know you don't have to be super specific but what what do you see as as some problems that you may have to overcome for me well, I, oh, go ahead joe <laughs> I'm just going to say the list can be pretty long. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it depends. Again, it depends a lot on the venue. For me, for instance, I need to I need to make changes to adapt if I do start seeing more national showmanship come through here. I have some, and I can do okay. We have a to to speak to what you were saying there. We have a term here at the fairgrounds. It's we make everybody almost happy. That's our plan. <laughs> yeah. You can make. If you can make the majority happy, you're, you're doing all right. You'll never make them all happy. But, yeah. Um, yeah, the list can be long. And so being able to change my arena to adapt to your little random uh, 4-H show, but also be able to turn around the next weekend and, and hold the National Appaloosa show or whatever it might be, to be able to meet all of those demands, I find the smaller venue has to do a lot of work to keep up. Um, and that's something, again... That's a good thing, though, because it forces us to have to have a better venue. Labor cool. shortages, Henry. as we all experience these days, I think uh, making those quick turnarounds are, are difficult, um, you know, and, and having good quality trained staff that, that uh, are focusing on the same things that we all are trying to focus on. Um, 
you know, that's, that's just a challenge in the market that I think all businesses are dealing with right now. Yeah, staffing in general, for the lack thereof. Yep, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that one in a minute. But what about let 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 me throw one in here as a question? What about manure? Because from a commercial, and I I'm not trying to be overly silly, but people don't think about this. Um, when you guys just brought up growth, how do you manage growth at a venue which is about capital allocations and cost of operations? Cami specifically. Um, made reference to the tight turnaround because in the venue world, you know, it's like the hotel business, you know, you got to turn, you got to turn it over. And so you got to get it ready. And so when they're done, you got to clean it up, do all that stuff. Yes. And that's all real. And, and show producers and show exhibitors and all of us involved in the industry take a lot of those things for granted because we're only worried about how things are when we're there. But just as a, I'm not, I wasn't trying to go anywhere in particular other than I did spend two parts of the country doing what you guys do. And so manure management, and when you start to get to volume of horse shows week after week after week, um, you know, unless you're in Broken Bow, Nebraska, uh, you, you're pretty limited on geography on what you can start to do with manure and so, but yet it's a biological, actually, it's kind of, I always use the analogy of a chicken wing. You know, when I was a kid, the chicken wing was a throwaway part of the chicken. And actually where I come from back in Buffalo, New York, are the ones that figured out how to make the chicken wing the most valuable part of the chicken. So in our world, how do we take something that's actually nutrient good and blah, 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 and, and you know, make it a more useful byproduct. And so I, is that a space amongst the league that is a common conversation? Absolutely. That, there, um, it is something that gets taken for granted. People don't even think about that, but it's a big deal. Uh, me, for instance, I have a, I got to worry about stormwater, so I can't have any manure even in my parking lot. If it's there, we got to get it picked up um, or we can face fines from the, the state because I'm close to a state river. So I've got a pond on site, everything drains to that pond and everything, so it all runs down water, you know, downstream. And uh, so I have to be very careful with what we do with ours. We've got to get it hauled out right away, but uh, California is facing a lot of issues with manure. Um, and I think I, one of the people that uh, I learned the most about when it came to manure management was George Chattanooke. His, the way he handled the Los Angeles Equestrian Center with that was I am. Um, I I learned more from that trip down there than I have in in most of my professional career. Just because he was making he he made the best out of out of the situation that you could possibly make with producing um, you know compost, compost there on site. Yep. So both ends of the horse, you're making money. Like that's that's entrepreneurship right there, entrepreneur. But <laughs> that's a new term. Yeah, Wikipedia will have that up. Entrepreneur. But and I agree with you. I 100 percent. And yes, I'd been there and visited and picked George Brain a lot on that one. I thought he kind of had it figured out. I'm, I'm amazed that that hasn't been modeled yet across the rest of the industry. So uh, anyways, I'm lucky enough to where I can take mine to a local farm and they and, and, and I say entrepreneur because the guy that comes in and hauls it out for us. That's his, that's what he's got written. In the title. <laughs> that's a good guy. He knows what Ours makes its uh, way to a hay field as well. So we're, we're kind of blessed that way too. I have a, a vendor who, who utilizes it. Um, yeah. So. It's that's a great. huge at the league. Yeah. We talk about, we talk about it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and with the whole American economy, but even the world economy on the recyclable, you know, that whole thing. And so um, trying to figure that out on, on the manure. Um, I, anyways, I, I've always been fascinated with that conversation. So thank you. Let's talk, um, let's talk ground for just a touch. Because as we all know, ground isn't just dirt. And I know when we have government facilities and you're dealing with commissioners and elected officials, and if they don't understand the ag or the livestock world, they will think that dirt's just dirt. And what do you mean you got to spend this kind of stuff on footing? It's, it's just dirt, right? 
I know that the league's got uh, two highly valued professional relationships, one with GGT focused on synthetic uh, synthetic footing for the hunter jumper and dressage world. And then of course, Kaiser arena specialists. And we did a show with them not too long ago. Um, um, and Jody and I both know Bob and Jim really well as well. And they have certainly figured out the scientific details on natural ground. And so um, tell us or talk to us from a uh, industry you know, from the league's perspective of having 200 venues across the country, the current demands, you made reference to it a little bit, Joe, and Cami, you did too on turnover, but now as we see ground management and high pressure on competition, which means each type of competition is going to want ground their way, what does that kind of mean? What's the demand feel like between the show producer and the venue and as the industry constantly wants better. So just go ahead and talk on that. You know, as far as um, facilities needing to grow, uh, when we talked about that, one of the things that I think more people are going to have to face in, or tr try to see if it's a hurdle they can overcome is um, footing storage. You, you know, being able to move that out of the arena and bring in uh, discipline specific footing. Um, that's something I think we're starting to see more and more people try to do. I wish I could. Um, so learning how to deal with multi-use footing is still something we work a lot on. Bob and Jim Kaiser, the reason we have a footing academy and a footing um, piece of our league. That's how I ended up coming to the league. You know, been with the fairgrounds for 28 years and you feel like you you feel like you're doing okay. You know, you're, you're getting by the shows seem to be happy. You feel like you're doing okay until you spend about five minutes with Bob or Jim Kaiser. I got a lot more to learn. You can never, you can never stop learning and you can never stop improving when it comes to footing. Uh, the, my favorite quote ever that I've ever heard is from Bob Kaiser. And that's the footing you can't see is what gives the horse its confidence. That's such a profound statement from a guy that knows what he's doing, you know? So, that resonated with me to start to think i've got a lot more to think about other than just trying to make this show happy that my signature is literally on that arena when i drive out of it so for us to be able to have these academies and and teach people how to manage their footing and take dirt out of the equation because it's a scientifically formulated footing i need to be able to use what i have in my arena for a cutting event and then turn around and have a raining event and hope again that I can make everybody almost happy. So yeah, pudding has become uh, um, way more important than it ever was in the past. I think, you know, back in the day when I first started working at the fairgrounds, they would call the local road maintenance guys and say, Hey, we need some more stuff. <laughs> the arena. You might have road maintenance in there. Like, literally, yeah. you know, so, and the other thing is with your horses evolving over the years, they're, the horses that we see today, they're used to riding in the perfect possible environment. That's what they're used to. So if they come into a venue that doesn't take that seriously, we're talking injuries to horses that you, you know, that's going to affect your bottom dollar. That's going to affect your uh, facility. So if you can improve your, your footing in your facility, you can bring in more disciplines. You can bring in more revenue. Um, so yeah, footing is probably one of the most obviously one of the absolute most important things you can you can get right or work hard to get right. You know, from equipment, training your staff to be consistent. I can go on and on. Um, I watched I've watched all your episodes, but you know, when uh, you were talking to Jim, listening to Jim talk about footing, I was, I can sit in, at, at a bar with Jim until the sun comes up and talk and talk footing. It's just fascinating to me and other people like you're talking about dirt slap your mouth um, that is uh, big. <laughs> joe there have been times that jody and i actually have done that so anyway we might not want to fess up too much but um, right yes yes go ahead kimmy no i i i've already kind of told you all my bob kaiser story and that's you know again i i think uh, we're in a facility that has to have dirt that works for for all of our events because I don't have that luxury of moving things out in and out either. Um, but in, in choosing that right material that we put in from 
the get-go. So many arenas over the years have had to pull everything out and get their the right, right ground in. And fortunately, uh, we made the right choice at the beginning to, to go with somebody who, who knew uh, what did, to do. So. How'd, how'd, you find, how'd you find Bob in the first place to call him? <laughs> you know, I, we had an, another employee here that, that I was working with. Um, he was kind of into rodeo some, and he had done some research and came to me with his name and said, Hey, I think you need this to call this guy. Yeah. And yeah. that's what it is. Good. Yeah. Which is the network of the industry. And so that's, that's, that's good. Okay. Well, I, I think that that's, I think that's interesting. And I'd like to just throw out the, the GGT, you know, the specialized, the synthetic footing here for just a second. And, you know, I'm not super familiar with it. The only place that I've ever really been around it and, and had a chance to ride on it um, was at the old NRBC venue down in Katy. And I don't even know if that's a GGT footing. I, I, I don't know, but I do know that it's the synthetic footing in some of their outdoor arenas. And it's it's marvelous to ride on. I mean, it, my goodness, it's like, and I, it's like, <laughs> and they have these big signs, don't stop, don't spin, right? I mean, it's like, you can't do any of that stuff, but it's like, man, it really makes me want to do that because the footing looks just beautiful. But I guess it's because of, you know, the venues that you have. I mean, it, it maybe can't stand up to the to the Western style of riding, but I, I would be interested in the synthetic footing, maybe, maybe, to have a, maybe to have a show with them sometime, something like that, Brian, because I... I'd be interested to know if they're trying to develop one that maybe would would fit more than one discipline. I'm I'm not familiar with that. So have you have you Cami or Joe have you have you been have you had experience with that? I mean, hands on or seen that footing? Yes, and the uh, fiber footing uh, fascinates me too. It's like the magic sand. You know, you get out there and you know, when you're a footing junkie, like most people should be, if you own a venue, you you get, you get kind of giddy when you get out and stuff. It's so fascinating to get a hold of, and I'm with you. I wish there was a way where we could get uh, a little more depth with it, if you will, so you could do some some different um, disciplines. But I think the problem is is whether or not you have the right give and the right grab to be able to do more Western disciplines, and that tends to be the problem. Um, but no, absolutely fascinating, and I think that it's going to continue to evolve. I'm kind of curious where that goes because I I'm always fascinated with the fiber footing field. Well, I, I think you guys are all going to be, for any of you that haven't, um, when you go, to, and we'll get to symposium in a second, but you're going to be in Central Florida, so not only at the Tampa State Fairgrounds, but the World Equestrian Center, brand new, has a lot of that, and so you're going to hear that. But even hearing Jim talking, yes, we will follow up. Um, Jody brings up, maybe we need to have those guys, uh, GGT and Kaiser, and because Jim talks about... Um, one is a contamination of that because it's synthetic, which comes from the horse manure. And so it, it, it'll break down faster than natural materials. Um, but two is, as the industry collaborates and works together on that, it'll be interesting to see um, what they might come up with. And so the, the good news is the industry is kind of looking forward and working together more than where we've been in the last 20 to 30 years where everybody was just kind of focused on doing their thing and they just did it that way. So um, we will follow up on that. Okay, well, cool. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I think that we're just going to continue to see things evolve and it's uh, definitely something I think that has room for ex exploration and see where, where it goes with that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and I'm relatively confident that in time, Cami, uh, and to all the venues on the you know smaller to mid level, um, will we figure out how to make it more cost effective to specifically manage ground for higher demanded disciplines? And I, I'm confident that we will. It, it will just which goes right to what you were just saying, Joe. So that evolution and will we figure that out? And when I watch the industry over my career and lifetime, we've come a long way. And so I'm confident that we'll keep figuring that kind of stuff out. So it, it, it'll come. And I think, I think what the league is doing is one of the key hubs on, on how do you keep that information kind of together and flowing in the network accordingly. So Jody, you it's, got some educational questions? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, education, since, you know, Brian and I spend so much time from the officiating standpoint, I'm, you know, I, I'm constantly saying you can't over-educate. 
And, you know, it's a common theme, and we're never finished with it throughout the whole industry, no matter what. And how, how does the league, how do you guys pursue education across your membership? I mean, into the industry, how, how do you guys help teach the people coming behind you or the new people that are coming in? What do you do? Cammie, can you help me with that? Sure. We, we started the uh, CMEC program. I think it was, we started tracking education credits back in 2004. And like Joe said earlier, we bring in speakers, uh, knowledgeable folks that can share that information um, that, you know, on a wide variety of things. Um, you know, there's, they can earn uh, education credits for each session that they attend during the symposiums. And, you know, we try to try to focus on uh, three core areas of business management, center operations and event management. And that CMEC program, you know, uh, it's an incentive for, for all of us to learn more uh, about venue management um, and, and achieve a certain standard um, across the board that we all, you know, it, if you attend the symposium as a member of the league, we can say that we've all met these uh, different levels. Um, it gives some credibility to us as venue managers. Um, and, and how you do that is just um, attend those sessions. We track your credits. Um, once you've uh, met that that level, which for us is 45 uh, credit hours, basically, takes probably about four years of attending a symposium to get to where that proficiency we feel like that's there. They also, as uh, we've mentioned multiple times, is about attending the Sitting Academy. Uh, it's one of our core educational areas that uh, both draws people in and educates them further and, and making sure that, again, we're all quality facilities. Uh, so they have to attend a footing academy. And then, you know, once once they've done all of that, then they, they all apply for their certification. They have to write an essay. And for some of us who've been out of uh, the education area arena for a while, writing an, an essay with a bibliography <laughs> can sometimes be a challenge, but we... Well, it, like for my case, I reached back to my my college age and uh, a little a little removed from that help for writing an essay again. But um, and then they come to a symposium. Um, we sit down with them, our education committee does, and they present their paper. Uh, we assign them a topic uh, that is pertinent to the industry. We have a list of of things that we want to learn more from, and so by assigning them a topic. Uh, it also educates the membership when they read those essays. Um, somebody else did the research and we can learn from that essay. Um, wide variety of topics. And then, and like I said, they present that paper, we do a little interview with them, and then we consider them uh, a graduate of the uh, Certified Manager of Equine Centers program. And then they'll continue to uh, learn and stay with the program and, and every three years they're recertified. Um, we've graduated 28 people um, as certified managers. Uh, we're quite proud of that. We'll have a new um, somebody that we're going to add to the to the ranks. He's, he's key on our footing committee uh, and is a board member, um, Jay Brower, that's applied and will, and will receive his certification this year. So uh, it's key component to to the league. Uh, so uh, we value it. I think that's one of the main main values that we can give our membership of those education opportunities that they may not get if they're just staying at home. So, well, my my guess is there's no other place in the country that you could get a certification. Isn't that a true statement? No, uh, this is in cooperation with Middle Tennessee State, and and right. you know it's the only it's the only thing of its kind. So right. Right. So good for you guys. Congrats. Kudos all the way around. The good news is um, with open AI and chat GPT and automated um, intelligence, the ability to write essays is going to get easier for everybody. <laughs> so you, you can, the bad news is you had to do it the old way. The good news is the new ones are going to be able to do it the new way. So that's, that's anyways, good for all of you. Good. Um, similar to that, well, Jody, did you have more on education? No, no. I just just remind me never to try and pass that program, okay? <laughs> if, if I ever decide I need to do that. So, anyway, no, go ahead. That's great. Uh, 
if you got to supplement the Social Security income, being a certified <laughs> equine manager is not in your is that not in your portfolio? Is that the point? Uh, it'd be like my high school girlfriend that did my math homework for me, right? I need to, I need to find somebody to do that essay work for me. But anyway, uh, now that's just incredible information. Again, one of those things that we take for granted that helps. I mean that 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 makes these things what they are. So yeah. anyway, kudos to you guys. Thank you. For the work yeah. you do and it'll it'll help the whole industry but that goes parallel with professional staff and yeah no matter where in the world you talk this is common everywhere everybody says they can't find good help and then they can't keep them so that's common get it we can talk about the macroeconomics all day long and never come up with solutions but if you talk about this phenomenal industry called the horse world which I think is, this is my personal opinion, I think it is phenomenal. And I think when you get through all of it, what makes it, I think there are two, this is my opinion, there are two core ingredients that make the horse world as great as it is. One is the horses itself, and that's a common denominator that all of us truly adore, respect, get involved in whatever level we want, and the rest is people are good. Um, and if you want to put good people around you, it's a great industry to be in. So with that simply said, career development and professional development and finding, I, I you know, Joe brought up the, 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 the horseless rider program at the 4-H level. That's a phenomenal idea. Are there other things? It, it's kind of an open-ended, broad question, but it's not one that any of us can take lightly because one – opening the door for opportunity and then two, developing those people so that they actually can keep growing and going rather than, you know, leaving the industry. Elaborate on that to any way you want. Well, you know, I I think, um, as we said, the the network of of, uh, of people that that are members of the league, um, I don't know. I, there's just a passion, I feel like, uh, but amongst all of us that dedicate ourselves to this. Um, and then, you know, the willingness to share that information uh, so we can learn from your mistakes or your successes and sh- continue to share and network, network that. I think on the higher education side, I, I certainly hope that universities and some of these ag pro programs will start recognizing that facility management and operations is a is a career path and that they start providing um, education in in those fields um, I, I think it, it is a career there's a for a lot of us so I, I hope there's there is that um, path forward with higher education to start offering some things like that well, may, maybe I, I just want to maybe there's an opportunity to get the league and some of the intercollegiate equine programs at least talking and, you know, getting some of the leadership from the collegiate programs, administrative management. Maybe they need to know about the league and come to the symposium and start talking about I just pose it as a as a idea. So um, anyways. I had the pleasure of meeting with um, some, uh, it was actually a 4-H group. It was through our Texas A&M Extension, um, had brought a group of, of students. They were all seniors um, out to Katy, and I went up and had was able to present uh, information on the league and, and a career as, as a facility uh, manager and what that looked like. And, you know, some of those kids had actually been to our facility and competed, which was which is cool to to be able to interact with them. But um, they did reach out, and I was happy that Extension had made that connection. And, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's necessary. And there's some universities, obviously. There's some in Kentucky and such that, that are do have that focus, but I think it needs to be more uh, widely across the state and uh, the U.S. Right. Well, almost every state's got an Extension service to some degree sure. in its weather. And, and even from the U.S. to EA down through – that network because it's already there so i just it, that idea just popped up while we were talking about it so good for you okay yeah. well i i know brian i know you the symposiums come up several times and i know that there's a lot to talk about and and this question i found fascinating because like i said from a guy who 
you know, used to take his own hand garden sprayer to the horse shows with him, you know, to make sure that his, his stalls were going to be as sterile as I could possibly make them. Um, can we talk just for a little bit, and Joe, I put this one to you about the biosecurity um, and, you know, by on the disinfecting practices and, and what your venues do. And, and I mean, I mean, obviously, I, it's probably impossible to say that they can all be exactly the same, but w w what happens there? Well, and I think that we see it more and more um, today. If, if, so one of the things we, we partner with the EDCC so we can get notifications through the league, um, what's happening out there as far as, you know, diseases. And it's, there's never a day that goes by that something's not on my email about some something somewhere, an outbreak or something. So to be aware of that and, and to have a practice within your facility, if you don't have one, you need to get one. Um, how do you keep things clean? So when we, we have a, a, a large event come through or a large horse show come through, we go in, there's a there's a specific standard practice, uh, you know, the rails, any any touchable space needs to be disinfected and cleaned um, from the stall to the bleachers where people are, are sitting. So using the technology, and you can see some of that um, with our sponsor there, but there's so many different ways to do it today with the backpack, things like that, that are, um, it charges, uh, the cleaning solution that comes out, it's hydrostatically charged. So it wraps underneath handrails and things. So it's one thing to have to go and do all the, uh, disinfecting, but it's also something where I've only got so many staff and so much time. So how efficiently can you be and how often do you need to do it? Um, after every major show, you need to do it because we don't know where people are coming from. And you, you know, you need to be aware of what's happening in the nation because if I do have a national show, horses travel today better than they used to before. And they could be coming from anywhere to my event and I don't know it. Um, and that's something we talked about the other day is uh, some facilities like myself, I don't require any health certificates. And I kind of wish I do did so. I have to educate my staff how to recognize a horse that maybe looks like mm, we might want to take a look at it as a runny nose, runny eyes, or watery eyes, things like that. So it's a it's a it's a big subject really when you get into it. So it's it's one thing to have a clean facility. It's another when most of us are in a position to be an evacuation center. With that brings a whole other avenue. So there's a forest fire here and everybody has to come here. They may even know their horse is sick, but they don't know what else to do. So they bring them to you. That just became your problem. And not only is it your problem, but you have 844 other animals on your site that you need to protect now. What do you do? And if you don't have a plan, you better get one today because it could happen to you tomorrow and you don't know it. So biosecurity is a huge subject. Um, and that's something that we have with the league. Now we spent, a few years, Cami, I'm not even sure how long it was. We spent a few years developing a, a biosecurity form that can that will help you exponentially if you're involved in that. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to look up biosecurity and what should I do. If you ever try to Google that, pack a lunch because you're going to be there all day long <laughs> reading through stuff. And you, you're so confused and overwhelmed, you don't know what to do. So we thought, you know, we sat down as a board thought we've got to create something that we can provide our members that can help you through one of those situations. And again, I, I bring George Chattanooga up. He had to go through a, a quarantine situation. You have no idea the impact of one until you've gone through it. So if you can nip it early, you might get through it. And if you didn't and you have to go through it, there's a way to do it. And we've, we've, we've broken that down into, I don't know, as small as you can actually get it without uh, getting too in depth. Um, so yeah, biosecurity is, is, is one of the things you can't talk enough about. You really need to understand it and get involved in it and know what to do if it affects you. Incredible. That's, that's another thing that we take for granted. I mean, it's just, yeah, great information. What, what we do and our horse show producers are just as guilty. So I would challenge us on the network function, and, and I think everything Joe was alluding to is highly valuable, but how do we make it easier for, and I, again, this is something that I see as the industry is trying to grow and move forward. The, the 
horse show production used to be very focused within the state. It rarely crossed state lines. It's now becoming more normal, and I think that we're going to see more of that. Why that's important is because of this type of subject. So now as a network and and the league being a primary wheel to that, that is a centralized hub of information and data so that a horse show producer that was in Kentucky last week and is going to be in Colorado next week and Nevada the week after that – not only know the activity that's going on, but also know the practices and protocols that have been done or need to be done and be working with a venue accordingly because what they have is their exhibitor list. So they actually know who's coming from where. What they don't have is a public function, but the people become somewhat different from the animals. But um, anyways, I, I agree with you, and I think that that's one of those bigger ones that as an industry is got that and ground – and how do you grow in capital with venues, you know, would probably be in my top list of the big things that we're faced with in the future. It's, it's changing and production is changing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, on that subject, tell me on the big one. And, uh, I was still very active on the venue side during COVID. So I had my own experience, but it's not that from a league's position, and I don't need to go back and get into the politics of the COVID and people. That's not it. But the fact that COVID happened in our country and it happened worldwide and it interrupted everything, including our world, which is horse show activity, but it didn't do it all the same. So uh, from a league standpoint that it didn't do it the same, were there any big lessons learned coming out of all of that? that the industry as a broader level needs to be thinking about? I, I, I don't know. I, I truly am curious. Yeah, I, I, there were so many lessons learned there. Um, one of the things for me, and again, it was a kind of a dependent on the facility, but one of the things for me is keeping the horse piece of it moving was a little bit easier because you can't help but social distance when you're, <laughs> when you're dealing with horses, right? <laughs> Get, uh, uh, two people I riding a horse, you're six feet apart. No, <laughs> <laughs> you social distance a little bit automatically. So that helped a little bit. Um, for me, it was um, understanding how to deal with the public on two different, either you wore a mask or you didn't wear a mask. I, for us, it really helped us learn how to communicate with people better. Um, you you got to hold your ground and you got to follow policy, but at the same time, even when you disagree with something or, or agree with it, you've got to be able to support it. Uh, that's your job. So I think we learned from that. Um, as a league, we learned that we were able to, I mean, it took, we took a hit just like everybody did. And we're, we're still recovering from that, but we were able to continue to have forums and, and bring people together, even if we were just, again, the league tends to be one big family, one big support group. And during COVID became, um, that, that became more obvious than it had before because we were able to hold, how many, what did we do one month, Cami? I think it was, we did like yeah, one form a month. month. Yeah. yeah. They were well received and we had a lot of people that just got on there just to talk about what are you doing? What are you, what, how are you surviving? Um, just to be able to help each other out. And, and out of that came a lot of really useful information for how people dealt with it. And there was some pretty ingenious things that happened out there that really saved my bacon and saved my facility to be able to use that because I, I learned it through these forums and talking to other members, you know, so I think that there was a, there was a lot of lessons learned and ways to survive a situation like that, and that's what what I noticed personally across the league. You made the reference to the league's a partner with the EDCC, the Equine Disease Communication Center. Um, what does that mean? What's partner with them mean? Well, with those, they, we through we provide uh, through our members if you through the EDCC we put them on to uh, the email list. So you get a, a notification of, of all of the different outbreaks, diseases across the nation. 
And what's so important about that is I look at every single thing that comes up in the EDC, and it might be something that's that's on the East Coast, and I'm over here. But as you mentioned, Brian, I could have someone from the East Coast here in a week. Yep. And they may not know that they were actually infected in the East Coast before they loaded up and headed this way. And because you're on the road, you may not, you know, we're in a world where we don't necessarily listen to, to news anymore, right? We're listening to, <laughs> you know, podcasts. Uh, yeah, we yeah. Should. And yeah. uh, listening so, to listening to you. Yeah, yeah. So they may not even be aware when they get to you, but I, I, I know that I saw on the email that, hey, there was a disease coming and then here comes this, uh, an East Coast plate in here. I'm going to go have a vet take a look at that horse ahead of time. And that's when I talk about being ahead of the curve educating yourself what's around you what's in this nation because it could come to you yep. and it's, it's good to have that so that partnership helps us to educate all of our members what's going on uh, in the equestrian world as far as outbreaks and diseases and things like that and how can we get ahead of it and with that because we're nationwide it, we might actually be able to help stop something like that from continuing to spread because the education is out there so for the average horse person, because it's a website, I'm very familiar with it. I'm on their automatic list too. So I get them all the time too. But for the average horse people that aren't thinking about those things now with technology, because you can just go on, I think it's EDCC. We'll look it up and put a link for sure. I think it's EDCC.org, but don't quote me on that. Um, but for the horse people in the audience, if you're not familiar with it, you should. And it's really easy to put your email in and just get the notifications. Um, and then you can do with it what you want. But even if you put it in your, your notebook thing where it's an easy click and, you know, you're going to go on the road to an event, you might want to look at that. And anyways, yes, it's a phenomenal tool. I th I've been overly impressed since it ever came online. So, And it's good for managers to be able to promote yourself and say, hey, you know, we're we use the EDCC to be aware of all the diseases and things coming to our facility. And by the way, when you come to our facility, it's also clean. Yeah. You know, that's a good, uh, you Jody coming to a, a, a facility to see a placard on the barn you're entering. This is this place is cleaned with, and the last cleaned on this date. And this, at this facility is aware of all possible outbreaks that there are. You're going to feel pretty comfortable going in there and probably going to see an ex go around make a huge difference to me from a professional standpoint without question it would even save you a little money joe because you could leave the sprayer and the labor and the juice at home so oh my I, I don't know if i ever did any good for myself but we did it anyway so right yeah, yeah. but yeah I, I would have preferred not to do that right so anyway yeah. it's good you know it's funny not to interrupt but that's a good a really good point i think when we talk about the showman and the, the director or manager of a facility. I think a lot of people, for instance, you just showed up with your own stuff to do that. But I think there's a lot of people that are shocked when they say, hey, you know what, I went and talked to one of the, the grounds guys and asked them when the last time was that they disinfected. I think a lot of people, if they hadn't done it, are more than willing to come do it for you. Because for me, personally, I know Cammy's the same way, customer service is highly, highly important in this field and you are the customer and so whatever you need don't hesitate to ask for it it's funny i run across that all the time where people after the show i find out oh this or that went wrong I'm like why in the hell didn't you say something i could have done it when it happened <laughs> we are so willing to bend over backwards to help you uh, have a successful show because if you're successful we're successful and i think that that lack of communication if i could say anything talk to the show manager, go knock on the door, grab that grounds guy off the golf cart and ask a question because they're most likely willing to do anything they can to help you. That's great information. Absolutely. Makes you almost want to go back and show again, huh, Jody? Yeah, yeah, yeah not probably not. But yeah, but it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like, I, you know, and not to, not to jump back and try to take too much of our time up, but I was, I was just thinking about that. My first world show maybe was in 1983 and everybody showed on wet, wore out mud. I mean, <laughs> with a with a little rotating harrow drag that wasn't worth, I mean, it was awful. And today, like I keep saying this, we take it for granted. 
trainers today, if they looked at that footing, they would say, I can't take my horse on it. It's dangerous, right? And Brian, our vintage, we just went ahead because that's all we had. So the the things that you people are doing with the league is, I just can't, from a professional standpoint, I just can't say how good it is. Anyway, okay. Brian, go on. Let's well. Let's we're 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 pushing as always because the quality we've got two phenomenal experts and the quality of conversation is outstanding. And every time we have this, time marches fast. So um, we're we're certainly pushing to it. The symposium. I want Joe and Cami. I want you guys to talk about. We've we've briefly talked about it, but the the symposium, your annual symposium. You've got a number of programs. Um, this year it's going to be in Ocala, um, but I also am aware of this. So, one, talk about the symposium. What does that mean? And a big one is why does it move? Why does it move year to year? Well, we move year to year so that we can try to reach as many venues and members as we can. As you can imagine, uh, everybody's got a different budget. Uh, if the if our symposium was in Florida every year, we would miss out on folks in Wyoming. We would miss out on folks, you know what I mean? So sure. we try to move around so that we can be as available as we can to our members. Again, our members are the whole reason we do it. So that's one of the reasons it moves around. Um, and without it, we don't have the ability to sit down and talk face to face. And when you mentioned COVID, we, we really struggled with whether or not we should even try to have another venue so we we felt it was better to just have some forums because the face-to-face is so critical and so important we can do this and talk like this for an hour but you can imagine when we go to these symposiums and we're there for three days i mean i go to bed at midnight and and get up at seven in the morning and i'm too old for that crap i'll tell you right now but i love it when i'm there <laughs> like i said if it's yeah. not jim kaiser it's it's will rogers more I'm, I'm down talking to kevin kemp and we're talking about all his new latest and greatest procedures and picking each other's brains. And we sit around there and, and geek out, if you will, about facilities where yeah. most people are rolling their eyes and falling asleep. We're down there learning and, and, and gathering information to improve our personal career and everybody else's facility. So yeah. that's why we do it. Sharing and network. Yeah. And I hear you. It, it, that will... N- this has always been one of my forecasts. As technology continues to advance itself, I made the reference to open AI because that's kind of a new big piece. Fine. We will not replace human to human, and what does that mean? And that cannot be replaced because those things that you just made reference to, when you're having lunch and having coffee and sit in the lobby for 20 minutes or whatever that is before that next session, before that next organized thing, that is the value of people-to-people interaction, and you can't replace it. So, no. yep. Uh, and I think we're we're in these when we are in the industry, we are involved in multiple boards. We are involved in multiple organizations. And I will tell you from my personal opinion and my personal experience, if I were to drop all of them and just have the league, I'd be happy with that. I've got more out of the league <laughs> than I have in any other organization. Um, and it, it I, I don't kid you, the the value is, I don't know, it's priceless to me. Just just to be able to pick up the phone and call anybody I need to, and they will bend over backwards to help you out. Yep. Well, that that's near and dear to my heart, Joe. So uh, anyways, I heard you loud and clear, and um, thank you. And I'm glad that that means that to you. So this year is going to be in Ocala, and you guys are going to go on a little bit. You've got three different venues that you're going to actually tour, right? Because that's part of the annual symposium, your ability to go tour other facilities, um, for that whole educational component. So, um, right. So just talk a little bit because you're going to go to Tampa, you'll do the world equestrian and you're also doing, what's the third one. We're going to check the Southeastern livestock pavilion. We're going to go to the world equestrian center and also the horse, the Florida horse park, the Florida horse parks where we're going to be teaching the footing Academy, the advanced uh-huh. and, and uh, introductory. We'll be doing that there. And then we tour that the tours are great. You know, you bring the tours up. I always, I always laugh when we go to these tours because here come 50, 60 people that run facilities like this 
And it's funny to go to these facilities, especially like the World Equestrian Center. Mm -hmm. These are people that are overlooking at your trash cans in fascination, and they're looking at your equipment and kicking the tires. They don't care about, you know, all the niceties and fancy stuff you have out there. Right. I want to know how the hell you're handling your poop. And I want to know what your trash is doing. And right. what is that bag made of? How many mills is that? And it's so funny because the, you know, the managers that run that and they're giving you the tour are always baffled. They always tell you afterwards, like they ask questions I had, I was not prepared for. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You talking about education, you go see some of these facilities. It's fascinating. Yeah, and yeah. the pictures that we take at these facilities are always funny, uh, you know. I mean, when you come back and you look at them, but it, there's always a reference point of something I'm going to learn that they were doing like, hey, I need to do that too. Um, yeah. It's not your normal photos. <laughs> yeah. People are out there digging in your arena. It's, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, can you just so that the audience can understand, because we've talked a good amount about the league, but... The fact your membership is venues, is that the only membership that you guys got available or are there other ways to be a member? Um, talk about your membership real quick. Um, we, we're actually exploring some other options uh, so we can, again, so we can broaden our horizons a little bit and be more open to just about anybody that's in the equestrian world. Um, so we haven't quite, we, we're going to go down there to Florida and kick that can around a little bit and try to figure that out because I think it's so important to be as as inclusive as we can be. Um, what's our stall requirement again, Cammy? You think I'd remember off the top of my head, but I can't. Do you remember? Number? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not I sure. Think, but but that's okay. I think but I will say we also have allied members who right. are are that are vendors and sponsors and people that support our industry. And we would love to see that area grow. Uh, I think it's crucial. Uh, there's such an educational point to that as well of exposing us to what's the latest and greatest out there. So we have allied membership and then our center memberships. Right. So the business supply lines with the allies, but then I think that there's another one because, you know, most people think on the individual level, well, me as an individual, I can do this, do that. And that's not quite what the league is because on an individual you'd either be a staff or a manager or something but the business supply lines but the horse show producers and i think that that would that's an interesting one and i say that only watching our industry because horse show production had always been so siloed within the states and i'm seeing the industry starting to broaden that um and that's true across all of them I don't care what the sanctioning is. USEF, AQHA, APHA, disciplines, all of them. Look at what the American Horseman production, it's a brand new event that doesn't even carry direct sanctioning. Um, I'm talking about at the American Rodeo that's going to happen with cow horses, rainers, cutters, um, and the run for the million. You know, you've got these things. you got World Cup happening now at a large level. And so um, the, the, there's something there because horse show producers and venues are a direct, uh, yeah, I'm using the term loosely, but that partnership, because they're all working together, which is on the exhibitor and the people, the fan, the spectators, um, best interest. And so uh, I, I just wanted the audience to be fully in tuned. And then you guys, when you kick that one around, let that one jump in there too. So, Well, some of the better conversations we have are is when we have a panel of producers down at the league um, and have that back and forth discussion. We get so much out of that. Well, we're, we're at that time. We're actually slightly over it. We can't thank you too enough. I mean, I, I, I just can't say thank you enough. And I say it on every show Jody and I both do. Um, but thank you both. I want to thank the league, um, your board, your membership, you make sure when you get together with them, um, that we, Jody and I, truly appreciate what you guys are doing, guys and girls, all of you, um, what you're doing. Uh, thank you. And thanks to all their staff um, for everything that they do because the rest of us in the horse world, Jody's made reference to it, um, and it continues to get better. And so thank you very much. We appreciate that. Well, thank Again, you very I just, much. No, I, I, I second that. Cammie and Joe, you've been, you've been just great. And like I said, 
Brian, he's he's pretty humble, but you know he <laughs> he knows all of this, right? And and but I don't. And like I said, from an educational standpoint, it is. I, it's an eye opener, and I know that people when they tune, when they when they turn this show on and watch it, they're going to learn as much as I did. So, anyway, thank you so much. It's a you know the league is awesome, and and uh, I, I'm not finished with it yet. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> they might not be finished with you either. So right, um, exactly. Again, th- thank you both for your expertise on multiple levels. Thanks for your involvement. Thanks for your passion. Uh, we, we, we do appreciate all that. Uh, we will be providing all of the direct links through the Cowboy Office website. When the episode gets published, the audience can get the direct links to the league. Again, L-A-E-C, L-A-E-C dot info is the website. Um, we will get you there. And do remember, audience, um, wh- however you consume this episode, don't forget to hit that uh, subscribe or like button. That's what keeps us going. So horses are good for people. We appreciate it. Until next time, enjoy the ride. Thank you, guys. Stay Thank in the middle. You. Today's episode is brought to you by 40 Productions in cooperation with the Consultant Agency, a full-service agency that helps bring forward-thinking equine brands into the 21st century using digital skills and services such as website development, graphic design, social media, and media production, such as the podcast you're consuming here today. Thank you so much for riding along with us today. Sign up at cowboyoffice.com to be the first to know about topics affecting the industry we love so much. You can reach out to us with topics you care about by finding us on TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and all podcast platforms. And remember, share this episode with someone that may enjoy it, because the more we can share our horses with others, the better our world will be.